All right, this time we're gonna show you how to sight in the Alpen Apex scope. Now Ryan's got his AR-10 and he's got the Alpen Apex four and a half by 27. Now he also has the sunshade and the honeycomb on it and it comes with the scope. And what it does is it filters out all this sunlight that we're dealing with here today. So again, your gun would already be bore sighted like this one is, take the first shot and then we'll show you how to make the adjustments after that shot. All right, so as I said, the next step was to bring the crosshairs down to the bullet. But before we do that, we're gonna take the caps off and we're gonna pull the turrets off, okay? And there's three set screws in there that we're gonna loosen up. We're gonna go ahead and make those adjustments, get everything sighted in. And when we finalize the sight in, we're gonna tighten those set screws, put the turret back so we have a zero position on it, and then we'll put the caps back on and we're good to go. The next step now is Ryan's gonna hold the bullseye on the red dot, and I'm gonna make adjustments to bring the crosshairs down and over to the bullet. And that's what we're gonna do right now. Pretty close, aren't we? Yeah, just hair to the right. I gotta go to the, to the left. It's gotta go left, right? Or not? Yeah, I got to go to the left. Are you on? Or... Yeah. Okay, so I think this is right. Good. And I got to go down just a little. Yeah. I don't know. Where just the side of that red, but I pulled. So we can pretty much assume that we're we're on, you think? Yeah, I mean, it's in the red. All right, that's all it takes. Three shots, and we're in the red. You know, here we are midsummer here in Iowa, and I'm uh, I'm just out doing some scouting, glass and deer, uh, kind of taking an inventory of what I've got, and uh, doing it from a distance. I've got one of the new Alpen spotting scopes. It's a 20 by 60, but one of the things I really like about this, it comes with a tripod, and it's got micro adjustments, so it's really easy to zoom in and, and move around uh, and find those animals. But uh, basically, uh, this is a great tool to help me manage the farm all year round. If you're looking for a, a great way to do some scouting, do it in the evening from a distance with a nice spotting scope. Hi, I'm Rick White with Alpen Optics, and I want to talk to you today about the new Alpen Shasta Ridge binoculars. Now they're lighter than the older Shasta Ridges, new sleek design, fog proof, waterproof, BAK4 prisms, phase coated, and the lenses are multi coated. Inexpensive pair of binoculars with great quality. So if you're looking to save a little money, but still put quality in your backpack, make sure you check out the Alpen Shasta Ridge binoculars. You know, good optics are a must for a hunter. The new Alpen Tetons. They're lighter, they're better in low light, excellent, excellent glass. You'll be hard pressed to find that glass for under $1,000. Everything that you would want in a pair of optics. I know what I'm looking for, and once I know what I'm looking for and find what it is, that's what I'm interested in buying. The bottom line is they're affordable, they're lighter, and they're great in low light, the new Alpen Tetons.
another deer coming out. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another episode of On the Hunt with Alpin Optics. I'm your host, Rick White, and on this week's show, old running buddy of mine, Mr. Matt Moret from Pennsylvania, will be our guest talking about CWD and some other things going on in Pennsylvania. And of course, don't forget at the end of the show, our weekly special. And on the hunt with Alpen Optics, and uh, you know I'm your host Rick White as as usual. But uh, and uh, tonight's guest, an old buddy of mine, a uh, gentleman that I worked with for, for quite a few years, and and uh, of course he's been in the hunting industry for for a long time. Uh, Mr. Matt Moret, Matt, how are you doing? I'm doing good, Rick. How are you, buddy? Good, good. Uh, you know, I, I I think most people probably know you. Uh, uh, but uh, you can uh, maybe just uh, give a little bit of information about yourself and what you're doing nowadays. Okay. Well, you know, it, I doubt if they do because you know I've been out of the industry a couple of years. And, and uh, but bottom line is, you know, I'm I'm from Pennsylvania. I live pretty darn close to Harrisburg, which is the capital city. And and I met you, Rick, when I I had moved to Iowa. I was working for a company called Hunter Specialties. I was out there about six and a half years, but worked for them for over twenty mainly in the turkey industry and, and, and whitetails. And, and um, I moved back home and started a, 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 with another company. Oh, in 2012, went to work for Zinc Turkey Calls and Avian X Decoys. And we built that brand. And, you know, as, as it happens in that in the hunting industry, a lot of those brands have, have sold and, and went to conglomerate companies and so on and so forth. But an opportunity came available in 2019 to go to work for our uh, game commission, Pennsylvania game commission, which is, you know, like DNR department of natural resources, except here in Pennsylvania, we're fortunate to have pretty dang close to a million hunters. So our game and fish agency are two, two separate entities. And, you know, I've, I've got to do some incredible stuff. Obviously, Rick, you and I've traveled the road a lot together and, and had an amazing career for 30 years. And I, I really thought about it hard and I'm able to give back and, and learn a lot more about conservation and a word that I used all the time when I was in the, the outdoor industry and I'm really doing it now. And, and uh, they, the opportunity was in marketing and outreach strategic communications. And it's, we're one of the only agency state agent, wildlife agency, because that's what we are. We're the state's wildlife agency that has that bureau with in its walls. And um, it's been a, it's been a challenge, but it's been fun. And I, I learned, I swear I learned something, if not 10 things every day of things that we thought we knew as hunters and outdoorsmen that that we really take for granted that happens in, in, in state agencies, in your wildlife agency, no matter what state it is. Right. Yeah. Do you miss the old days a little bit here and there? Oh, no, I hated it. It was awful. <laughs> yeah, I miss it every day. I mean, I don't miss going anywhere with you because that was I mean, that really right. wasn't any fun. But yeah, I do miss the old days. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm gonna I, I'm not sure about it when I have to go around with Rick either. So I mean it's one of those things. Yeah, see, see I'm, I'm at a little disadvantage because I have to let you guys talk first. If it, you know and that was gonna be my line. But uh, hey Matt, you know, working for the Pennsylvania. Actually, I've, game. Hey, I've I've got all your lines right here in front of me, so you might as well not even try them because I'm gonna tell them before you do. <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, so, hey, tell us a little bit about uh, what Pennsylvania has to offer. I mean, you know, you allow non-resident hunting, of course, and, and you, you have a lot of hunters, probably probably one of the states with the most hunters. Uh, I don't know if it's, you know, but it's it's certainly rates up there. And, uh, but uh, but there's some good hunting. I mean, I've hunted Pennsylvania, but the, the, the non-resident wanting to come to Pennsylvania or, or maybe just someone that wants to get into hunting, what, what all do you guys offer in the state? 
Well, here, here's the beauty of, of PA. Our tradition runs really, really strong and deep. So our state population, there's 12.8 million people. Well, about 1 million people buy a hunting license in our state. And, you know, what we have to offer is pretty incredible because our agency alone, the, the Game Commission, we own 1.6 million acres of managed land for wildlife, state game land system that's open to the public. And we have partners like our Depart Department of Conservation and Natural, Re Natural Resources, which is like your state parks, things like that. There's almost another two and a half million acres of open hunting lands. We have a lot of opportunities to, that people can enjoy in many different landscapes from the big mountains, which you and I were like up in Potter County, which mountains you don't want to climb. If you remember those days, Rick, they were, you know, yep. and none of us are any younger, but to, to land that, like you're used to in, in your home state of Iowa. You know, our, our deer population is very strong. And, you know, 15 years ago, we implemented antler restriction where, you know, we weren't shooting, we were shooting 95%, I don't quote me on those numbers, of our, of our antler, our bucks, they were shooting year and a half old deer. Well, we've learned from our partners in the Midwest that if they give them a couple of birthdays, the age structure comes up and, and it's better for your deer herd. So we're never going to be Iowa per se, or the Midwest, but the opportunity to, to harvest a, a, a beautiful animal in Pennsylvania is pretty good. Our deer population is strong. Turkey population is, is real good. And, and, you know, we're really famous for bears and, and our, our bear harvest and population has been extremely strong over the last, you know, 15, 20 years. So we, we have a great organization. There's a, a lot of great people that uh, make this happen in the state from our agency, from volunteers, and from every single person that's a conservationist that, that buys a hunting license. Right. Now you have, you guys have an elk season as well, I think, right? We do. We have a herd of elk, roughly around 15, 1600 elk in the state. And, and they're in one area, we, what we call the elk range. And the elk range really is a, a really low populated area. And we went in and managed and helped manage a lot of this, you know, elk or grazers. So they need fields. This is in the middle of the mountains. So we're working a lot on habitat. This year, we, we gave away 187 elk tags. Matter of fact, archery season's underway right now here in PA. And uh, we're seeing lots of photos of some great bulls that, that have been taken. It, it actually ends this Saturday. And I think you guys, if, if I'm not mistaken, you guys have a lottery uh, for your elk draws, correct? I mean, similar to what? like Kentucky does, anybody can get into it for little money, really? Yeah, to apply. yeah for, it's 11, I think it's 11.97 to apply for an elk tag. Now, I mean, obviously we only give away 187 book tags, but if right. you drew a, if you drew a tag in PA, you're going to have a heck of a hunt and, and opportunity to, of, of a trophy of a lifetime. But, you know, there's, there's, we have a lot of applicants, but you can't put in, you can't win, you can't get an, you can't get a tag if you don't put in. That's what I tell everybody. But, it, you know, it's 11, it's 12 bucks and uh, it's worth it to me. I promise you that if I draw a tag, I, you're, you're going to hear me yell from your house. Right. You know, you know, I, I know you and, and, and a lot of others and, and myself included. When we got into the hunting industry, you know, obviously we we had a job to do, but we really the whole focus and the whole goal behind everything that we've always done has been really to get more people involved with hunting kids and women and adults to like really just get more people involved in hunting uh so i'm assuming that you have a, a pretty good opportunity for 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 kids and new hunters in pennsylvania as well we do we're you know here's here's the deal like in our old days rick you know we we were infant in the jakes program at nwtf and and we're always trying honestly where we were at we were trying to create more customers to sell turkey calls or a bottle of deer pee or whatever and, and it, it's important. It, it, and if you look at across the, the nation, it's one of the most important things that we can do. And, and you keep hearing this in mainstream outdoor media that license sales are going down and they are, I mean, across the country. We've, we've really got some programs here in PA that we're pushing the envelope. And we're actually, we have seen a two year pattern of a license increase. And that's we're one of the only states that, that that's happening in now. COVID and everything that happened, you know, last year with I call it the asterisk year because it, it it was just different. A lot of people weren't out on the weekends doing everything and staying busy. So they 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 came back to the sport that they grew up with. So real excited to see, 
you know, our licenses went on sale in, in uh, July, July 1st. And, and we're seeing a, a pretty steady increase as we speak. And, and our big time is coming up as we get into, you know, our, our, our biggest bump we'll see next will be firearms deer season, which, you know, is ours is after Thanksgiving. So maybe I'll slide back and tell you how, how good it was this year, because we all want to see that grow and we want to see more people get involved. A absolutely. You know, um, and we're, we're, we're going to talk about some CWD here just shortly, but, uh, you know, turkey season, uh, you know, obviously you and I are, we were turkey hunters. And uh, uh, most of the states that I hunted this past spring, I would say our turkey numbers were down. And in some of those states down pretty drastically. Did you see a, a little bit? Are, are you guys down a little bit or are you, are you still pretty strong? I mean, we were well, strong and I we're down in Iowa, but we're still strong. But places like Kansas and Georgia and Florida, and some of those places, they're down to where the, the hunting isn't near as good as it used to be. Well, I think we've all experienced um, the heyday, you know, when, when, when obviously there was no turkeys in the 1900s. And we've watched this, the game bird come back to a point that was unbelievable. I mean, especially in, in, in the Midwest. And I think we're experiencing a little bit of normal, number one. Number two, I think as we look at across the country recruitment time for turkeys obviously in the spring late spring when the little ones are on the ground it's crucial that we have great weather and you know that there's lots of things we can blame it on we have we we're not at goal let's put it that way i don't want to say we're down we have places that are really good and we have places that really needed a hatch and one of those areas here in pa that really needed a good spring we had our 17-year uh, cicada hatch this year in that area, and, and the recruitment that we're seeing going into fall is pretty unbelievable. We had a great, great year for little turkeys, and we need about two or three of those, and we'll be back, we'll be back swinging. But, yes, as a rule across the country, and if, you, if to a little inside information, there's four or five state agencies right now that are devoting tremendous amount of effort and funds into trying to figure out what the answers are. Um, Pennsylvania being one, we got a, we got a program that's going to start this winter, but we're going to ban um, gobblers and hens, radio collar, lots of them. I mean, tons of them to, you know, see if we can figure out what might be going on. And, you know, the other side to look at it, here's the bottom line. Conservation is a word that you and I have used our whole life. And we know, we know what it is but we are conservationists. But when you get involved with everything that happens with your state agency, honestly, one of the biggest issues that we have that we face today as sportsmen is habitat and all animals. That's the key. And it does, it sounds kind of crazy about turkeys, but tur if turkeys don't have the right habitat to rear and to brood poults, their survival rate goes down. Everybody wants to, you know, say, oh, predators, you know, we have fishers here and, and bobcats and coyotes. Predators have been around forever. And it's a, it's a cycle. I'm not saying that they don't get turkeys. They, they absolutely get young turkeys. And a, a, a poult's chance of survival is, is slim. I mean, it's tough. It's tough for a little turkey to make it to, till it has feathers, but it's all, it, it, it's all in check. I mean, we're not, the predators, if, if they don't have something to eat, they're not going to be in the air. Um, but habitat is crucial. And that's something, that's a word that everybody, we all say it, but when you really look at it, take it in the human perspective, if we didn't have houses and running water and, and a place to use the restroom and a place to, to cook food or whatever, if, if we start losing our habitat, our survival rate is going to go down. And it's the same way out there in, in, in wildlife and habitat changes. And that's where our agency, like our agency, we're out there creating as much new generation, you know, young forests, places that like birds, like our state birds, the rough grouse, and it's having some trouble right now. Um, it carries West Nile virus and in low, lower uh, altitudes in, in warmer client, climates, uh, our population is diminishing. But in areas that we went in and are creating new habitat and where mosquitoes aren't getting in higher elevation, um, we're seeing the grouse really start to rebound. So there's all kinds of things that are going on out there. And I, I say, let's hold our breath on the turkey population. Let's see what happens here in the next five years. I think we're going to find out some answers 
And, and number one, I think a lot of it's going to be the climate, the weather in that brooding season that we've just unfortunately had cold, damp rains when those little ones are under two weeks old and it's not helped our recruitment of young turkeys. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're spot on with a lot of that stuff for sure. Um, let's talk a little bit about CWD, chronic wasting disease uh, that is hitting our deer herds. Uh, Matt, Matt you per, maybe you know, I'm not really sure, but there's only a few states that, that claim that they don't have CWD. Uh, Iowa was one of those states up until about two years ago that didn't, uh, had no diagnosed cases anyways. We, we now have it. It's, it's mainly on the eastern part of the state. And I'm told that soon it will just it'll just move throughout the whole state. Uh, but uh, you guys are doing some things, and, and maybe other DNRs are as well. But you guys are doing some things really uh, kind of ahead of the game. Uh, you, you're you're just seeing some CWD in the last year or two, I believe, in Pennsylvania. But you guys are kind of working on some different things that that are helping. But talk, I guess, talk about chronic wasting disease and and what I mean, what's good? What what should we do? What shouldn't we do? That kind of thing. Well, it, it was discovered in Pennsylvania in 2012. So that was our first case. And here's the tough part about CWD. And I was on the other side of the fence as a hunter. And I'm like, ah, there's nothing, you know, th that's just mother nature and this and that. I mean, and lots of people still are. That's a battle we have, we face every day. It's here. It's real. And no, it's not wiping out everything out there. It, I mean, you never see that CWD is a slow disease that you only can see the suspect animals in their last day or two of life when it when it when if you ever catch them. where ehd or blue tongue you know you, you go to a pond and there's four or five dead deer laying around a lot of times mature bucks it's showing you that it's there now but we can get to that later but cwd um <clears throat> it's it came to pennsylvania in 2012 and and, and really developed fast in a core area and right about in the middle of our state. And we call that, you know, the established area where our prevalence rate is about 12% now, which is, which is heavy. So what we've been doing is trying to keep it there because we can't get rid of it. I mean, the, the science and scientists are trying every day to, to figure out how we can fix this issue. That what we're trying to do is anywhere that it sparks outside of that core area or that established area, we try to enlist our hunters to help us thin the deer herd out in that area because the less deer the less chances are it's going to spread and the other part of it is is we can monitor and, and evaluate and sur put surveillance on that area to see where the prevalence rate is and right now that's the only tactic that is known out there you know anytime that you're overpopulated and the disease hits you know you got to thin the herd and that's what we're trying to do in these sparks or these flyers outside of our established areas we have four disease management areas in the state newest one is in the northwest part of our state where it's one deer came back and tested positive um, this deer was in a captive facility so it was in a high fence but we don't know if it affected any of the wild or any of the wild populations affected so we're you know we've outlined you know a, a certain radius around that positive we're right now in the middle of enlisting hunters and providing opportunities for them to to shoot more deer and testing of their animals um, we have head bins all over the state in these areas including and i personally live in a disease management area and we can't take those animals after, if we harvest them outside the area you have to get them processed if you use a processor inside the dma and we just put lots of rules and regs it, our, our, I'm just going to be honest, we, we ran a campaign last year about CWD and any conversation that you have internally and externally, it's, it, it's a, ours with CWD sucks because it really does. It's, it's, it's terrible to deal with, but it's here. Those states that are claiming that they, they haven't found it yet. Honestly, I, I'm not throwing a, a fastball, but they probably haven't checked enough because it's all around us from Iowa to PA. And, and, and it's something that we're going to have to, in our lifetime, we're going to have to deal with. Is it earth shattering? No. But when you look at the future, um, we don't know what the future holds. And, and it is, and I, we're all tired of this word, but it really is a pandemic in white-tailed deer. I don't think we need to cause all kinds of fear, but 
if your state agency, whether you're Iowa, Missouri, Pennsylvania, Maine, I don't care where it is, if they're asking for help, whether it's volunteering samples to get your deer checked or, you know, you go, you, you go into an area that you might need to lessen the deer population, it's not for this hunting season or next hunting season. It's for 10 years from now that we can. And that's where that's where we're, what we're trying to do. We're just trying to educate, inform and and buy as much time till we can get this thing figured out yeah it's uh you know cwd uh affected deer from what i understand do not survive i mean they they don't live through it where ehd you know hemorrhagic disease a deer can actually survive that uh not not always but they can uh, well, they so also can rick they also on ehd they can develop an immunity that's why you don't see it as strong in the southern part of the country because they've been doing it for years and when those deer develop an immunity and they reproduce their offspring have immunity and you know we're obviously cwd is a different a whole different cat and and it, that's not happening uh, you know and and, and it, it, evolution's a crazy thing and when ehd comes to pennsylvania which it does our deer have never ever been around that it, it, it's like smallpox in in human uh in times when it wiped out and diseases european diseases that wiped out our natives in this country when europeans first came here it's the same thing these deer have never been exposed to it so it hits them hard that's why you find 15 deer laying by you know a water hole that, that got that midge right. but there are some survivors as well especially younger deer right cwds cwd there's you know it is more prevalent in bucks and you know kind of like us i mean the older we get the more at risk we are for all kinds of things and it's the same it's the same in, in animals but it, it can it can affect any deer and it's silent and they can carry that that they can carry cwd for years again you only see it at that last anytime you, we get a cwd suspect it's the last few days of that deer's life right now and Look, I, I, i've got I, a i've got a question for you it's from the uh from the viewers here um you know rick did you now rick you you said that uh you found some deer well i i did you know i was just gonna say you know matt as far as i understand cwd is a a transferable disease uh deer get them from other deer uh where ehd does not so ehd is what they call a hemorrhagic disease it, basically in a nutshell during a drought time of the year uh when the water levels are low uh, the deer will go out to drink water and they'll walk across that mud. This is just one example, but they're walking across that mud to get to the water and there's a midge fly that that lays its larva in this mud and the deer gets bit by the midge fly and uh, it affects, they get a fever and uh, it, it kills some deer. And I just found uh, one of my better bucks here close to the house when I was, was on my hit list for this year. Uh, I found him dead laying in the water uh which i'm i'm sure was probably ehd so so uh, becky becky wants to know uh becky whitaker wants to know if uh you're going to have the deer tested and what do you think about testing because uh, well, you know in arkansas they're encouraged to have every deer tested that they that they uh that they take especially the ones that are that they find that have are, are gone for no you know traumatic reason like getting hit by a car or, or hunting right. well like ehd from what i understand matt you feel free to jump in at any point but uh there, 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 as far as i know there's no test for ehd uh now ehd is just uh it, it basically just makes a deer it's it's like us getting the flu more or less i mean they get they get sick and some of them can't tolerate it and, and they die now cwd uh and i'm not aware i, I know they're trying to develop some tests but as far as I know, and Matt can touch on this too, there is no proof that anybody that has eaten a deer with CWD affects a human. In fact, we know that people have eaten lots of deer with CWD. Uh, am, am I telling you to go out if you know it has CWD and, and eat it? No, I'm not, I'm not saying that, but it's nothing I don't think to fear at this point. Matt, would I mean, speculate on that a little bit. Yeah, I think, I think some of the fear you know, when, when any kind of news like this goes out, wherever you're at, that you, you get scared. Now, you know, government official CDC does not recommend consuming an animal that's positive to CWD, which nobody wants to eat something with a disease. And I get that, you know, for us, we offer those tests, our, you know, our agency, you can drop your head, your deer head in a bin 
and we we te- any deer that's shot in any of the disease management areas um, is available to be tested. And I thoroughly and it's you know it's free of charge. So we thoroughly recommend doing that. You know, it, it, that's not an easy process for any state agency to do, but thoroughly recommend getting any kind of suspect deer, you know, call your DNR if you have a sick deer, get it tested. Because that's yeah, I think that's what uh, the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission was after uh, when they asked you to get them tested. They, they, they're they not really concerned so much as you consuming the deer. They want to know if the deer population is infected, where at, and, and, and you know, are they are they migrating? Is it, if, is it going around? Things like that. That's exactly what they want because it because like Rick said, it is a deer to deer, you know, it's it's a spread. And, you know, I know in Arkansas that you can legally bait to hunt over and, and you know, in Pennsylvania, you can't. So people do like to feed deer, even, you know, non hunters. And so we we try we we have a ban on feeding animals, even in late winter here in, in the DMA. Um, we've actually went to the point of not not being able to use any kind of attractants anything that's going to and deer do it all the time i mean they go to a scrape and you know they're they're trading body fluids in communication in the wild we can't obviously can't stop that but anything we can do to to slow down or stop that process as a human involvement we're trying to do it's just educating and and asking for help to try to you know the best we can to keep deer apart but obviously wild deer lick each other and lick the same branches and rub their i mean we that's just their nature right Um, and and, yeah let me clarify uh, a comment that i made uh when i meant the state agencies do have the ability to test uh for cwd uh they're working on some testing that 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 the hunter could actually do i I don't know that it's available yet or, or or if they've got it figured out but uh so not every state does that but the states that do is a good recommendation and the other thing that i learned that helps in areas with CWD when you're when you're butchering your deer or you're field dressing your deer uh, and where to throw your carcasses and really it's best to just take them to the landfill. Uh, don't throw them, you know, uh, CWD deer when you just throw them out in the in the woods. Uh, those prions actually get into the ground and a deer comes by and eats a, an acorn off the ground. Theoretically, could attract CWD. Is that correct, Matt? I, I, yeah, that's way over my head. When you said that's prion, I understood from the biologist, said, but yeah, when you said prion, that got over my head because I mean they, they say that all the time. I mean yeah. those biologists are very smart, but yes, it, if you're like in our area, if if we're in a DMA like like I'm in right here, and I'm lucky enough to to harvest a deer, and I want to field dress it, you know, obviously we we gut our deer here and then skin it out and debone it. If I can't get rid of that in a landfill, the best thing to do because it is already established here in my area is, is well, at least leave those parts here in brain, spinal cord, lymph nodes, and um, spleen are the biggest items that, that you don't want to transport around. And, and we have a ban. If I come to Iowa and because you're a CWD state and I'm lucky enough to shoot a, a big old Iowa buck, I can, I can't bring any of those parts back with me. And yep. most states are doing that, you know, interstate travel ban, which I think is really important. And that's that's probably some of the ways that it got across the country. Now, if you look at where our hotspot is in our state, our established area, I mean, it, it follows an interstate right up through the and, and, and from West Virginia and Maryland. And, and evidently, it's pretty obvious when you look at that. Now, this is totally anecdotal. Just my guess. When you look at that heat map, you can see where it probably came into the state. Right. Well, listen, Matt, we're going to have to obviously get you back on the show because, uh, believe it or not, we're running a little bit short on time here. But uh, every every week uh, we have a weekly special and I want to talk just briefly about the weekly special for this week. Uh, Another another great special. It's the uh, Alpen Wing Series 10 by 42 binoculars, the model uh, 546 normal price. Well, first of all, these binoculars, they're waterproof, BAK4 prisms, fully multi-coated have twist up eye cups, they're lightweight and comes with a lens pen and a lifetime warranty. So uh, normal price on these $159.99 uh, on the hunt special through Sunday at midnight, 50% off. Uh, wow. So yeah, you're going to be $80 for a, for a good pair of 10 by 42 binoculars. Um, again, the, and, uh, and the, once again, your daughter has made the show. Has she? Well, good, good. I'll have to tell her. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, Paul came up. We shot a bunch of commercials and things here in the last couple of years, and and she was uh, she jumped in on that. But anyway, another another great weekly special. The wings ten by forty two, uh, and uh, you go ahead and order those. It's model five forty six. Uh, in the promo code, just type in on the hunt uh, with no spacing, and you'll get the fifty percent off, and that's Sunday through midnight. Uh, so uh, hey, next week's guest. Uh, we, we've done a little bit of shifting around, unfortunately, with Brenda's, uh, some of the things that she had going on, we, we've, we've curtailed her for another couple of weeks. But next week, uh, Wayne Shaw, and I know Matt, you know Wayne Shaw very well, uh, but he'll be our guest. He's always fun to talk to. And, and, uh, but Matt, hey, I want to thank you for, for coming on the show. And I'd like to ask you to come back, uh, you know, maybe in the next uh, month or two and, and we can kind of pick up where we left off, if you don't mind. Yeah. Heck yeah, buddy. I appreciate y'all having me. Which daughter joined, which daughter made the show, Carolyn or Mag? Carolyn. Yeah. That's well, if anybody wants to know, that's why Rick has gray hair. And <laughs> if he took his hat off, you'd see what because I have a 20 year old and I remember Carolyn when I probably I still owe her a birthday present from <laughs> 20 years ago. But no, thank you guys. I enjoyed it. And anytime we, we can come on and uh Keep doing what y'all are doing. It's it's a great thing. And I got to order well, me. A all I can tonight. say is that I'm glad I don't have any kids. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, Matt, if you need uh, if you need any options, we can certainly help you out. But uh, anyways, I, thanks again for being on. And folks, uh, thank you all for coming along tonight. Another great show. And and don't miss us next week, Wednesday, six to six thirty with Mr. Wayne Shaw. But for now, I'm Rick White. Thanks for coming along. We'll see you. Good night, everybody. doing a little bit of late evening scouting, just looking for deer and waiting for them to come out into the field. But I've got a new pair of Alpen Teton binoculars. You know, a lot of times people will ask me, what binoculars are best in low light situations? Well, that's simple. The answer is the Alpen Teton binoculars. And the reason for that is they have the Abbey Koenig prison, which simply means it allows 94% of available light to get through these binoculars, making them a excellent pair of binoculars in low light. So if you're looking for a pair of binoculars that will see detail into a dark timber right now, this time of the evening, make sure you check out the Alpen Teton binoculars. You'll be glad you did. Oh, here's some deer coming out right now. You know, good optics are a must for a hunter, particularly binoculars, not only during hunting season, but times like this when it's time to start scouting. But there's one thing you need to do when you get your binoculars that a lot of people don't realize. You need to set them up for yourself. Your, everybody's eyes are a little bit different. And here's how I do it. It's simple and easy. Just take the binoculars and just kind of grab good focus on an object. And I go and put my hand over the left lens. The diopter ring, which is on the right side, I will go ahead and adjust that until that right eye is in focus. Once it is, I take the hand off the other side, both eyes in focus, and you're ready to go. It's simple and easy, and it's a must that you do this before you go out and use them.